بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس ان ٹوڈیز کلاس وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ دا ہسٹری آف انگلش فائن لیٹ می ریمائنڈ یو آف واٹ وی ہیو ڈسکس سو فار ان دس ڈسکشن وی ہیو اسٹارٹیڈ لینگویج ہسٹری ان چینج فائن لائک دا ہسٹری آف لینگویجز اینڈ ہاؤ ڈو لینگویجز چینج ود دا پیسج آف ٹائم سو فرام یو نو so far we have talked about various topics such as uh, you know language families and uh, uh, family connections then sound reconstructions then uh, world reconstruction fine today let's talk about the history of english language uh, the list the history of english language is basically uh, it can be divided into four parts fine uh, the first part is called the old english period which is from 450 to 1100 then the middle english that is from 1100 to 1500 then the third stage is the modern english basically there are three stages fine three periods in the history of the english language so the second is from uh, 1100 to 1500 and then the third one is the modern english that is from 1500 till today okay uh, if we dig deeper these stages can be divided into five stages stage 1 that is called the prehistoric period of the english language prehistoric means before the history of the english language like the features which were there uh, in the languages from which later on the english language came into being fine so if when people uh, take into consideration those features that like the features which existed in those languages before 450 fine that period is called the prehistoric period of the english language then we have the old english period then the middle english period fine then the modern english period can be further divided into two steps step number 1 is for uh, two step stage number 1 is from 1500 to 1100 and stage number 2 is from 1100 till today fine so these are the various stages in the history of the english language let's discuss all these stages in detail one by one starting with the very first one the old english period let's talk about first about uh, the this period the people fine who spoke the english language in that era okay in the place where this language existed or where, where it came into being then we will move to the linguistic features that were used in the english language in that particular era fine in the old english period now here is a term used the anglo saxon period the old english period is also called the old english uh, the, the anglo saxon period why the anglo saxon period you must have to, you must have studied this thing in the history of english literature as well in your, your subject introduction to literary studies i think uh, sir zaid is teaching you that subject fine now why is it called the anglo saxon period due to these three germanic tribes fine angels saxons and jutes they were three tribes fine germanic tribes because they came from german they came from the northern europe okay and where did they come to they came to the great britain fine great britain is the older form of the modern uk united kingdom fine so they came to the great britain the angels and the saxons and the jutes uh, there was in another uh, tribe as well but uh, that uh, tribe did not contribute that much to the history of the english language to the linguistic features of the english language that is why linguists uh, particularly historical linguists they usually do not take into consideration that uh, another tribe fine uh, now they, these people uh, they were considered to be you know god's wrath towards britain because they were a uh, warrior in nature they all the time used to you know engage in wars with one another in fights with one another sometimes 
one of these tribes will dominate the other then the another tribe will dominate the rest of the two fine and then the other tribe and these fightings and these you know wars between these uh, three tribes they would continue what happens uh, what happened when these two tribes they were in power they were in dominance fine they the language which they, they which they were speaking they called that language is the english language fine the english due to the dominance of the Eng angels so they call it english and the place where they were living okay the, the land where they were living they termed it as england okay because uh, due to these people due to the uh, this particular tribe so they call it england because this tribe the people of this tribe were uh, were living there along with the other tribes too fine so this is how uh, from the, then later on from the word english and from the word england the modern word english it was derived fine in the modern world world england that was derived so this is you know uh, the basic background of the old english period did how did the old english coming to be in rather the entire english language fine uh, then here are some of the linguistic features which were used by the speakers of the english language in the old english period those features are uh, the words such as man fine this was the older form okay in, in the old english period it was spelled or in written like this now in the modern uh, english we have man fine uh, the word wife it is also uh, come from the old english period though it has gone through a semantic uh, broadening fine a uh, semantic narrowing uh, these are the things which we'll discuss later on in this very lecture semantic broadening and sem semantic narrowing uh, but anyhow the old wife has come from uh, the old english period the old child later on uh, the old child later on is became it became uh, become child fine uh, it is also come from the old english period the old house fine nowadays we have house uh, the old mate uh, or matey uh, nowadays we have the modern term that is food so matey is also come from uh, the old english period again it is also gone through uh, semantic broadening uh, uh, semantic narrowing sorry and this is what we'll discuss again later on the world uh, eaten which we have the modern term eat the world drinken uh, for which the modern term is drink okay and uh, this one fourth uh, fourth term for which the modern term is fight these are all the words which have come from uh, the old english period then um, as I told you that the old English period it started uh, in the 450 and it continued till 1100 so in the sixth and eight uh, sixth seventh and eighth century uh, the you know the Great Britain it was dominated by Christianity fine and uh, since the language of Christianity it did that time was the Italian language so Italian language has also contributed a lot to the old english period fine uh, what happened in the uh, great britain most of the people they were pagans in nature fine like uh, by religion they did not have any religion at all they did not believe in any major religion of that era fine so when they were christianized the words which were related to the religion of christianity those words were added to the language which was spoken in that era find the old english so the uh, the words which we have received from the old english period and those words were uh, you know added to the english language due to the influence of christianity and they were added from the latin language those words are uh, angel bishop candle church martyr priest and school there are so many other words as well fine now if we look at these words all these words are religious in nature they are from religious terminology they are, you know all of them belong to uh, the terminology of christianity fine so uh, christianity the influence of christianity is, is also contributed to uh, the, the old english fine then we have the last part of the old english period that is uh, from 8th century till the 11th century 
it was the era of Vikings. Fine, uh, Vikings were the people who came from Scandinavia and they came through the sea. Fine. So when they came to the Great Britain, again, they had their own language and they contributed to the English language. And from them, the English language borrowed words like give, law, leg, skin, sky, take. Fine. The older forms must have been different, but these are the modern terms which, are, which we are using nowadays in the modern English. These words have actually been derived from the old English. Fine. From the Vikings. In the uh, 8th, 9th, uh, 10th, and 11th century. There are hundreds and thousands of such other words. So this is uh, all about the old English period. That, uh, when did it start? Fine. Who were the people who started this period? And uh, where did uh, where did they exist, the people? Fine. And what were the, the words which were added to the old English, um, the, the, the English language of the old uh, English period? Then we have the Middle English period. Uh, while talking about the Middle English period, our focus will be on, you know, some important factors which contributed to the development of the old, of the Middle English. And then our focus will be on certain changes. Find the changes which uh, uh, took place in the English language when it was converted from the Old English period into the Middle English. Fine. So starting with the uh ex external changes external changes means those uh changes which were uh, uh which were you know actually uh brought by certain external factors like certain wars fine or uh, external influences simply you may say like they were not within the language they were from the outside factors so uh the very first factor uh that is uh, the French influence, fine. When the French speaking people, they invaded the Great Britain and they uh, came to the Great Britain, fine, as conquerors, okay? Uh, and they were with uh, uh, William the King. It was uh, somewhere in 1066, yes, 1066. So they came to the Great Britain and since they were the French people, they were speaking the French language when they came into contact with the English people. So they contributed to the English language. Now keep in mind that when they came to the Great Britain as invaders, fine, they invaded the Great Britain. So they were the people of government. They were the people of code, fine. They were the people of judiciary. They were like the entire Great Britain was in that time, uh, at that time in their control, okay, in, in their hands. So uh, the words which they contributed to the English language uh, include army, code, defense, faith, prison, and text, etc. There are a lot of thousands of words which uh, the French people contributed to the English language in the Middle English period. Then there were two types of people living in the Great Britain at that time. As I told you that the French people invaded Great Britain. Fine. So on the one hand, there were the uh, peasants, peasants were actually the farmers, fine, who had rented certain lands. They were actually the poor people and they were the original uh, people of that place, of the Great Britain. But on the other hand, uh, there were the French people who had, uh, who had invaded the Great Britain and they were the dominant group, fine. They were the people of nobility, they belonged to the upper uh, class families. So both of them, the old English people, like the, the people who were uh, the original uh, people of that place, okay, the Great Britain, and the French people, the people who had invaded uh, the Great Britain. So both of them contributed to the English uh, language of the Middle English period. Words which have come from the original people of that place, the peasants, find the farmers, the poor people, the uh, words like sheep, cows, swine. These are from the old English period. Fine, like the, the people who were living there, so already they were speaking the old English language. Fine. So uh, they contributed those words because they were poor and these were the words of their dead would they use. So they contributed these words to the, mod, uh, the middle English period. Then uh, the language which came from the French uh, people, since as I told you, they were the, uh, the ruling class, they were the, uh, you know, the nobility of the time. So they used to eat mutton. 
they used to eat beef fine and they used to eat the food with pork so such, such sort of words were added to the english language by the french language uh, people these are the words from the french origin another external uh, factor which contributed to the english language middle english period that is the great wall shift it was a period uh, which existed uh, in uh, between 1400 and 1600 uh, at this uh, at that time you know uh, in that period so many changes occurred in the vowel sounds of the english language a lot of changes one of such change one example is the here okay the o sound o fine it became o o sound it is vowel number 7 fine is in the word law fine or is in the word more m-o-r-e fine initially this word was used in words like moon fine this sound was you was used in words like moon but later on this sound was converted into it was replaced by the oo sound find the long oo sound the close big oo sound and nowadays we have the word moon initially its pronunciation was moon o o fine it was moon nowadays it is moon so this is one of the examples which you know uh, the changes the the uh, changes in vowel sounds which took place in this era from 1400 to 1600 the last external factor external change that is the printer by william caxton when william caxton uh, if you have read history when he invented uh, the printer fine for the first time uh, in 1946 it contributed a lot to the development of the english language fine how did it contribute uh, to the development of the english language initially people used to write books and other you know uh, written materials with the help of hands okay but when this printer was invented by william caxton they started printing books now when books were uh, printed so the, the english language it was properly codified okay it was transcribed properly uh, and then books were written so uh, this it give you know a sort of uniformity to the spellings of the english language because like uh, when uh, there was though there were uh, some standards for the spellings which people used to write with their hands but when the printer was invented so the the standard it was you know it was further developed the standard of the english spellings so when uh, this printer was invented it contributed a lot to the spellings of the english language and people uh, they you know developed or they they, 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 in, uh, they introduced certain standards from this for the spellings of the english language so these are the four external factors which have contributed to the development of the middle english fine now moving to the internal changes internal changes means uh, linguistic changes you may say changes in the uh, sounds pronunciation of the english language changes in the syntactic grammatical structures of the english language and changes in the semantic structures semantic forms like the changes in the meaning of the words fine so uh, internal changes are uh, here we are going to discuss three types of internal changes the first one is uh, phonological changes, uh, means uh, changes in pronunciation. Then syntactic changes means changes in the grammatical structures. And then semantic changes means uh, changes in the meaning of words. So starting with the first type of internal change, that is phonological change, fine. Uh, so many phonological changes took place when yeah uh, you know the english language was uh, the, when the middle english period started and people started borrowing words from the old english or you may say the old english started developing uh, de developing with the passage of time so some certain phonological changes took place in that era fine phonological changes means changes in the pronunciation in the sounds of the english language the first change was sound loss the second was metathesis the third one was epenthesis fine now sound loss means 
that certain sounds were lost. Fine. So many sounds were lost and they, they, they disappeared from the phonology, from the pronunciation of the English language. Like initially the word was, it was pronounced as hlud, uh, hlud fine, the, uh, the sound it was pronounced in the beginning of the word. But later on this sound, it disappeared, fine. And nowadays we have the word loud, okay. Uh, if you have studied in phonology, uh, complementary distribution, the H sound never exists in the initial position of any of the words of the English language. Fine. So uh, this is one of the examples that the uh, H sound from this word, from the word loud, it disappeared. Okay. Then uh, when sound disappeared, so uh, the the phenomenon of silent letters it came into existence like we have the word ni now if you look at the word uh, k sound it disappeared fine and this is what we call sound loss so this sound was lost from the pronunciation though the, the letter still exists in the spelling but the sound was lost fine the sound it was uh, you know it disappeared from the pronunciation we have the word no we have the word knowledge we have the word knock fine so this ka, ka, and ga, this sound disappeared. This is what we call sound loss. Uh, another example of sound loss is the uh, uh, velar fricative ha sound, fine, which is a feature of the Urdu, Pashto, uh, and Punjabi language. Uh, this is velar because it is pronounced by raising the big part of the tongue and touching it with the, uh, you know, big part of the mouth, the soft palate. And it is fricative in nature because uh, a sort of friction is produced in the mouth during the articulation of this sound, just as uh, sh, sh, fine, s, z, and f, f. in the same way we have the h sound. Now, uh, the, in the French language, h sound is very much dominant, fine. So, uh, as I told you earlier, that uh, the uh, like uh, the, the, the the French people fine they contributed to the English language but later on when uh, this sound the ha sound it was uh, it got disappeared uh, you already have a subject of French in your course curriculum fine and you must have studied certain words uh, like you have entrepreneurship uh, the modern world the English world is uh, entrepreneurship fine in uh, French it is called entrepreneur so the ha sound exists in the French language but this sound it disappeared in the uh, middle English period it disappeared from the English language like the word night initially it was nicht fine then it became uh, later on it is you know the, the modern term now it is then uh, the, we have the word night so initially it was nicht the sound, the velar fricative sound, it does, it did exist there, but later on it disappeared. Fine. So one of the phonological changes is sound loss. Uh, the second phonological change is metathesis. Metathesis is simply the reversal in the position of two sounds in the world. Fine. When a word has got certain sounds, but we reverse or we exchange the uh, you know the position of two sounds inside that word. That is what we call metathesis. It is a phonological uh, process. Now look at the word uh, freeze. Initially it was freeze, fine. So if you look at these two sounds, r and i sound, they exchange their position, fine. Uh, this is what we call the reversal in the position of two words or exchange of the position of two sounds. So initially it was freeze, they exchange their position, fine. The r sound, it was, before the sound, so then it was, you know, nowadays it is preceded by the sound. So we initially we had freeze, nowadays we have first, initially we had breed, fine, and nowadays we have bird. Look at the reversal of r, uh, r sound and I sound. Similarly, we have uh, the horse world nowadays. Now look at the reversal of these two worlds. Initially they were raw, fine, cross. And nowadays we have horse. So this is what we call metathesis. And this process, phonological process, phonological change took place in the Middle English period. The third phonological uh, change which took place in the uh, Middle English, uh, that is epenthesis, fine. That is the addition of 
a sound to the middle of a word. The addition of a sound to the middle of a word. Let me provide you uh, an example from uh, the Punjabi language first. The word school. Fine. School, the Punjabi people cannot pronounce a consonant cluster. A consonant cluster, Sir Asif must have told you about a consonant cluster. Fine, a combination of two consonant sounds. Now, s s sound and k sound, Punjabi people cannot pronounce these uh, uh, consonant clusters because this feature does not exist in their language. Now, what do they do in order to break down this consonant cluster? They insert a small uh, sound, vowel sound, and this is sakul. Citation. Fine. This is what we call appendix. Uh, appendices. Now, what happened in the Middle English uh, period? This phonological took uh, phonological change took place. Like uh, initially, there was the word uh, spinel. Fine, spinel. What happened? The word, the sound da was inserted. Okay, appendices. So this sound was inserted. The addition was done. Uh, another word that is uh, the, uh, the the older form was timber, but later on it became timber and the b sound it was inserted. Fine, this addition was made. So uh, these three phonological changes took place in the Middle English period. Fine. Uh, another process prototheses simply keep in your mind uh, the addition of a sound to the beginning of a word like. Uh, but the English language has got the word school and Punjabi people, they say is school. Fine, they add the I sound. Similarly, is station. Uh, uh, station and is station. Okay. So, uh, but uh, this process, this change, it did not took place in the uh, Middle English period. Fine. These are the phonological changes. Moving to the syntactic changes, the second uh, type of changes which took place in the Middle English period. Uh, the first syntactic change, syntactic change means the grammatical change, fine changes in the grammatical structure of sentences or words. So uh, the first change that is the word order, change in the word order, like if you look at the modern English or the middle English, we have the, uh, uh, the word order that is subject, verb, object. For example, they went or, or they ate the mangoes. Fine. So they, that is the subject, then we have the verb, and then we have the object. But if you look at the uh, old English period, fine, before the Middle English, uh, we had so many structures, so many structures. Like one of the structures was verb and subject. Like uh, in the modern and Middle English, verb always precedes uh, sorry, subject always precedes verb. Fine. Simply subject comes before the verb. But in the um, old English period, verb could, could also exist before the subject. Like, he, uh, uh, it means traveled he. Fine. So traveled is the verb. It it was it came first in that era and then he the the subject it came later on fine so uh, this was the subject which existed in that era like in the modern in middle english we have subject verb uh, structure and in that era this uh, the structure of verb subject existed fine then uh, subject object verb Fine. Again, it is also different from the modern in english uh, 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 grammatical structures this was subject first. We have subject, then verb, and then object. But in that era, uh, the structure was one of the structures. That was subject, then instead of verb, they had object, and then finally verb. Like here is the example. Fine. Uh, here is uh, the subject. Fine. He. Then it is fine. It is uh, it used for the word him in that era. Fine. And then this is the verb. Fine, it is for the world saw. So uh, that was another such structure which existed in the old, old English period. But when, as I told you, the, uh, the English, the Middle English period started, certain changes took place, and this is one of the change, or one of those changes. Okay, uh, that uh, this the structure was made like this. Okay, moving to the uh, third structure, object, subject, verb. 
object here we have object in the final position of a sentence but in that era in the uh, old english period it existed here just as we can see here fine initially like a sentence could start with the object like him man knee sealed no men give fine any to him now look at this him no men give him or to him so to him him is actually the uh, the object of this sentence but at that time him means the object could exist in the beginning of a sentence as well but when the middle english period started this structure was it's this structure disappeared fine and then the subject verb object people used to uh, you know uh, people started using this uh, particular structure the subject verb object structure Another phonological uh, change was uh, in the negative structures of the English language. Fine. Uh, if you look at the modern or the English uh, mid, uh, middle English period, we have the grammatical structure uh, for the negative sentences. Do not, does not, or uh, particularly if you talk about the past simple tense. So did not plus first form of verb. Like he did not go to school fine we do not say that he did uh, he do not went to school fine that is wrong grammatically we say he did not go to school okay but if we look at the old english period they used to use not plus second form of the verb like not give this is uh, according to the uh, middle and uh, modern grammatical structures english grammatical structure this structure is wrong why because the, the correct structure is did not give fine did not give this is the modern or middle grammatical structure which is the correct one according to these modern rules but initially people could use structures like he like in uh, for example he did not go nowadays we say he did not go they could say he not went for example clear so uh, this thing like not followed by second form of the verb this structure also existed in the uh, old english period but later on when the middle english period started so this structure disappeared and people started using the the modern structure or the middle structure which which is you know the second uh, first of all did not and then the first form of the verb uh, instead of this one he he not give the modern term or the middle english uh, structure that is he did not give find this give is used the first form not the second form uh, another grammatical structure syntactic change grammatical change that is the issue of the neg uh, double negatives according to the prescri pres prescriptive linguistics or prescri prescriptive grammar means a grammar which prescribes rules fine according to this sort of grammar we are not allowed to use double negatives double negations like if i say uh, i know nothing fine i know k n o w i know nothing fine so this is grammatically this is correct but if i say i do not know nothing now if you look at this we have do not not here one negative and nothing is another negative fine or i did not never go there so i did not one negative and never another negative so according to the prescriptive grammar the sort of uh, double negations are not allowed but if we look at the old english period people used to use these double negatives like uh, if you look at example here ain't fine uh, this is from the old english english period and this is from the middle english and modern english not give you me never a kid fine you did not give me a kid now we say you did not give me a kid we never say you did not give me never a kid because if we use never this is what we call double negations like we have got one negative here and another negative here uh, do not get confused regarding this structure not give 
this is what I uh, explained earlier, like this one, not give. This was the structure which existed in the old English period. Fine. So double negations used to be used uh, in the old English period, but when the Middle English period started, fine, and the English language developed, so this uh, this structure, the double negations, they also disappeared in the old uh, in the Middle English period. So this was another phonological change which took place in the Middle English period. Moving to the uh, last syntactic change which took place in the Middle English period, that is the loss of the inflectional morphemes. In, in inflectional morphemes, we have already discussed, if you remember, there are eight inflectional morphemes in the English language. Uh, four, of, uh, four of them are, uh, are used to, uh, you know, are added with uh, verbs. Two are, added, uh, uh, two are added with adjectives, the ER and the EST, fine. And two are added to nouns. To noun like we have apostrophe and S that is for position and S or E is for showing the uh, plural form. And uh, E or E is T with adjectives and four are added to uh, the verbs. The first one is the ing, fine. The second one is S or E is for showing the third person singular like he goes, she goes, fine. The third one is ed for showing the uh, second form of verb and the last one is that is en, fine. Uh, which is used for the uh, past participle form. So uh, inflection morphemes, certain inflection morphemes, they also got disappeared in the modern English period. Like if you look at the word sealed, fine. The word sealed, it meant in that era, he gave, sealed. This ed, ed, fine, it, it, it means he gave, okay? But this one, S E A L D S D sealed is it means you gave fine so the difference of the difference between you and he this difference in that era it was indicated by inflection morphemes not by different pronouns like nowadays we use different pronouns for these things like we have he and you but at that time in the old english period people used to use certain inflection morphemes to indicate pronouns fine but later on when the, uh, the middle english period started such sort of inflection morphemes disappeared from the english period uh, the english language so these were the syntactic changes which took place in the middle english period moving to uh, the last type of change that is semantic changes semantic changes means those changes which took place in the meanings of words fine uh, semantic changes are basically uh, of two types. The first one is semantic broadening and another is semantic narrowing. Now, if you look at the word broadening, broadening means like when something become, becomes broadened, fine. Uh, like uh, initially in the English, uh, old English period, there were words which were used in specific terms, fine. But later on, their meanings were broadened, fine. And this, uh, the people started using those words in general terms, not in specific terms. How? Like the whole, uh, we have the modern term holiday, fine. Initially, this word referred to religious, uh, uh, religious holiday, fine. Like uh, a break from the world, but due to some religious event or religious festival. Uh, they used to call it holiday, but nowadays we have uh, holidays every that day on which we do not go to work, we do not go to school, fine. So initially, the word was its meaning was very much specific because it was uh, it was uh, you know uh, restricted to only religious holidays. But nowadays, the word holiday is used for any kind of holiday. So this is what we call a semantic broadening. The meaning the meaning it was narrow initially. It was specific, and later on, it became general. Fine. Uh, another example is the word uh, fura. Fine. The word fura it was used for uh, for for animals, the food, the green grass, and those things which you know the animals eat. So this was initially the word "fura" was used in specific terms, like for the foods of uh, animals only. But nowadays we have food which, with the help of this word, we refer to any kind of food, like whether uh, food for animals, for humans, for any uh, kind of creature. Fine. Even we have uh, food for thoughts or food for 
computer system okay uh, food for electric generator okay so food is uh, the world the meaning of the world food uh, uh, it was broad and fine and nowadays food is used in very general terms not in specific terms we have the word dog initially it referred to a particular kind of dog a specific kind of dog but nowadays the word dog refers to any kind of dog and again this is what we call semantic broadening that the world of the uh, the meaning of the word dog it was broadened fine so this was one of the semantic change which took place in the middle english period then the last change the the second semantic change that is semantic narrowing it means that initially there were words which were used in general meaning fine but later on the meanings they were narrowed down and now those words are used and you know for something very specific for example the word haunt initially it was used for any kind of dog so the meaning of this word was very general nowadays if you look at the word haunt fine it refers to a specific kind of dog this one um the 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 dog which usually the hunters keep with them fine which is usually used for uh, hunting animals for catching birds fine or some other animals but uh, kept by the hunters particularly now this is if you look at this world it refers to a specific kind of dog not all kind of dogs okay and initially it referred to all kind of dogs now this is what we call semantic narrowing because the meaning of the word haunt it was narrowed down to a specific kind of dog fine uh, another example is mate initially it was used for any kind of food any kind but nowadays the word meat it is come from mate fine and uh, this word nowadays it is used for specific food fine uh, meat meat is a specific food like we have vegetables so many foods are there and meat is one of them a specific food so the me the meaning of the word mate it was narrowed down uh, then we have the last word wife um, initially in the middle uh, in the modern english period the word wife referred to any woman whether married single engaged divorced fine but nowadays the word wife is used only in only for the married uh, women so this is how the meaning of the word wife it was narrowed down to a specific meaning uh, i'm uh, uh, diverging for the uh, from the topic maybe but let me get back you uh, let me get you back to comparative reconstruction for a few seconds the final vowel sounds often disappear initially it was mate later on it became meat fine so it also confirms that uh, topic which we discussed in the previous lecture fine uh, based of the english language peer the english language so uh, we have uh, what sort of changes the english language is adopted in the middle english period phonological changes syntactic changes and semantic ch semantic changes uh, there are two terms which are uh, very frequently used in historical linguistics we have got historical study or you may call them historical variations like the uh, variations or differences between languages what is meant by uh, the, there are two terms find uh, two types of variations or two types of historical studies the first one is diachronic variations and the second one is synchronic variations now what is meant by diachronic variations the study of language from the historical perspective of, of, uh, of change through time this thing is very important through time then synchro uh, synchronic variations the study of a language in terms of differences within that language in different places and among different groups at the same time at the same time not through time fine to simplify it let's suppose if you take the example of the english language the examples which we recently discussed that what sort of uh, differences do we find 
between the old English period and the modern English, middle English period. This is what we call diachronic study. Like simply when we take the you know the two periods of a, of a language and we compare the linguistic features of that language in that in those two different periods to find out that what sort of linguistic changes has that language adopted with the basis of time. Fine. Uh, the English language, for example, if I uh, look at the English language of the 16th century or the 17th century or the Shakespearean period, and I compare the, Eng the uh, English language of that period with the English language of 2020, fine. And I explore the phonological differences or the syntactic differences or the semantic uh, differences or all these differences, fine. And uh, this is what we call diachronic study. Why? Because in such sort of studies, we explore the diachronic variations, mean those variations which a language has adopted, those changes which a, a language has adopted with the basis of time. F uh, fine. On the other hand, we have synchronic variations or synchronic study. It means that uh, when we take you know, the two different varieties of a language spoken in two different places are spoken by two different groups, but at the same time. Like, uh, let's suppose if someone explores the differences between the British English and the American English in 2020, right now, fine. So we do not go back into the past, fine. We may even go back into the past as well, like the differences between the British English and the American English in the English newspapers, which were written in uh, 2000, uh, 2005, for example, or 2010. But we will find out the differences between these two varieties of the English language only in, only in 2010, fine. We will not compare the changes of one era with the with with the linguistic features of the, uh, another era okay because then it becomes diachronic study examples from the urdu language for example if i take the urdu language uh, which was spoken in the uh, you know uh, 1990s and i compare it with the urdu language which is spoken nowadays in 2020 to find out that how many changes has the english the urdu language adopted in these 20 or 30 years fine like particularly the words which the english urdu language is borrowed from the english language so this is what we call diachronic study because in it we go for the Ch changes for the exploration of the changes which the language is adopted with the passage of time. Fine. But if I take the uh, Urdu language which is spoken in uh, Punjab, for example, and the uh, Urdu language which is spoken in Kapiki by the uh, Pashtun speakers, to find out the differences between the two varieties spoken by two different groups fine or two different places so if we if i conduct such sort of uh, study if i conduct such sort of exploration and find out such sort of variations between the two between the two varieties of the urdu language spoken in two different places by two different groups of people such sort of uh, variations are called synchronic variation and such sort of study such sort of exploration is called synchronic variation fine uh, today's discussion was about the history of the English language, fine. Uh, in today's class, we talked about the uh, Old English period, then we discussed the features of the Old English period, then uh, we uh, moved to the Middle English period, fine, and the changes which uh, the English language adopted in the Engl Middle English period. So uh, there were certain, you know, external changes like changes which were uh, uh, which were due to the uh, external influences such as uh, 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 you know the the people who came to the britain the french people fine or uh, the the language which were uh, the words which were uh, contributed to the english language by uh, the uh, the era in which the printer was, uh, printer was invented fine or the great wall shift the sound the, the changes which took place in the wall sounds of the english language then we uh, talked about certain internal changes, like the changes which took place in the internal phonological structure, internal syntactic structures, internal semantic structure of the English language. So phonological changes, we have sound loss, metathesis, epenthesis, and prothesis. In syntactic changes, we have word order, fine. 
and negatives and double negatives and loss of the inflection morphemes. Then in semantic changes, we uh, talked about semantic broadening and semantic narrowing. Uh, in the coming lecture, we'll talk about the differences between the two varieties of the English language, the British English and the American English, inshallah. Stay home, stay safe, Allah Hafiz.